Welcome to the 12th District, episode 105. This is Kerry Condotta for NCW Life. Well, we're going to take some time out today uh, to visit with someone we haven't seen for a while. Representative Keith Gaynor will be with us for the half an hour to catch us up on what's going on in his life now that he's finished the session. Actually, we're going to step back and talk about that session and see what he's up to right now and what are the issues that are in this district and what issues will he be facing in the short session which is coming up faster than we can all imagine. Time is really flying. At the end of the show today, we're going to bring you up to date on the Democrat polls, how those candidates are shifting. It's changed quite a bit since the last time we visited that. We'll look at the president's approval rating as well, congressional approval rating. And we're also going to talk briefly about some of the hot local races we'll be talking more about in the coming weeks as the uh, current election creeps up on us as well as uh, referendum, eight, referendum 88 and I-976. We'll be talking about both of those in the next show. And one more little tidbit at the end of the show today about uh, fundraising from various groups and maybe where you should or shouldn't put your political contributions. All that on episode 105 of the 12th District. We'll be right back with Keith Gaynor. Welcome back to the 12th District. I am thrilled to have in studio today Representative Keith Gaynor of the 12th District. We're going to talk a little bit about his uh, experience down in Olympia, his first time around in Olympia, and what's uh, coming up going forward. Keith, welcome aboard. Thank you. Good to have you back. So uh, what an experience you got to uh, go over and, and get. You got a couple committees. You got local government. You got transportation. You ended up with a state government committee. So that's a pretty good start, pretty good committees for a guy that came out of the county. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, getting into session, brand new things, what surprised you, what didn't surprise you, what do you think of the whole thing now that you've done a session? Well, it was a totally different form of government and that was the, the biggest uh, change. You know, at the local level you're, you're dealing on a weekly basis with issues and, and you can resolve a lot of those conflicts in a short period of time. but. When you get to the state, you know, the only things that happen are on the floor and, you know, when you actually have legislation, I mean, you have your, your committee discussions and all, but as far as actually identifying and resolving issues, it only happens during that session. So we did have a long session, which allowed for a lot of dialogue, but not a lot of resolution. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's part of, you know, the, the big difference in, in local government. Local governments, you know, they take responsibility for uh, that, that constant uh, interaction with their constituents, they're being held accountable on a daily basis. And at the legislature, you know, you go into session, you're done, and then, well, let's see what, what happens. Then you deal with that. it then. So you're really kind of isolated during the period that you're over there. You're doing the thing, and what you have is a final product at the end. Right. What about the committee work? Were you surprised at the volume of bills? Were you surprised at how many don't move or don't get forwarded? Well, in a lot of respects, uh, the things that I was somewhat surprised at, and, and you know, I know it sounds kind of naive to, to say that it was pretty political. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but could have uh, warned you. <laughs> some of the, th the bills that came, uh, you know, were they definitely had a, a political bent as opposed to really resolving issues that may be experienced by the the local governments as far as carrying out the wishes of the state. And what I'm thinking about uh, at state government level is that's where we talked a lot about elections. We yeah. talked a lot about the presidential primary and you know even some of the mechanics of it. And and really, you know, when you're sitting there as a committee, you don't have the the clear understanding of what the auditors are doing, who are responsible for conducting elections. And I don't know that we always have all the right people at the table to make those decisions. And so, if you're making a political decision as opposed to a pragmatic and practical decision. Then, then you may end up with uh, some unintended consequences. Yeah, it seems that a lot of times that we don't communicate to the people on the front lines. I noticed that, it, and occasionally they'll come over there and testify, but uh, there is a bit of a disconnect. Right. Uh, on the Transportation Committee, that was a very interesting committee, I'm sure, because that is very controversial now with what's going on in Seattle. Uh, one of the third worst traffic, I think, in the nation, but yet the number one rated public transit system. How do you reconcile the two of them? I mean, it sounds like they're just putting a lot of money into things and not moving people. 
Well, the transportation budget, you know, which should be a pretty, um, you know, you were t we're talking about physical things. I mean, very tangible uh, conveyances in the infrastructure. When I talk about conveyances, we're talking about the ferries. We are talking about transit. But the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, those are things that, that we've got a, you know, a good inventory on. We know what needs to be repaired. And yet that tends to be pushed to the side because it's more politically expedient to deal with the transit issues or you know electrifying the ferries new or, projects new projects and and that's where you know i feel like you know we really need to get a, a handle on what our priorities are at the state level and make sure that we're spending those the dollars that are being collected that we're spending them to really reinvest in what we have currently because maintenance is and preservation is the furthest uh, and, and biggest uh, element of the budget, but it, we're, we're falling further and further behind in keeping up with what we even have, let alone new projects. So it's, there's a number of challenges in trying to you know, be forward thinking in your, your transportation mm -hmm. uh, projects and yet maintaining what you have because that is really, you know, you need that to sustain you know, the amount of traffic that you're dealing with today. Well, I can tell you that trend uh, happened in the years I was there as the preservation was just less and less important, but particularly for this district, the 12th district, you've got some real issues coming up. Madhau Valley bridges are all coming apart. I mean, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, it just isn't happening. And there's going to come a time, right, when we're going to be in real bad shape. Because some of these highways, it's the only way in. It is. You know, I, the thing that I think gets lost at times, too, like when you talk about those Madhau Valley bridges, uh, that is the only point yeah. and particularly during the winter uh, you know if something should happen I mean if you lose a bridge which is really the case because they're all rated you know high priority for repair the Transportation uh, Commission has gone up there they've looked at them the transportation joint transportation uh, uh, committee has also considered those so I mean there, there's a tremendous amount of money that needs to be reinvested but my point was going to be that we don't have a, a large population base but it is critical for all the people that it is just being up there last week and talking with some of the the tourist uh, driven industries and the amount of people that go to the Met House yes. is incredible. Yeah. So I mean there's a dependency on people from outside the area to access that area too. It's not just the locals. And and the reason I say that is sometimes you look well you have millions of people in the Puget Sound area that's where the money should be invested. Well, yes, it should be invested there, but those same people come here. Yes. And, and our economy really is dependent upon getting good access to these areas that, that are uh, providing you know, some of those recreational opportunities. And that, that's really what keeps a lot of people uh, going in their businesses. Well, obviously, tourism has become a huge part of you know Agriculture and tourism are the two biggest things going on over here. So that is critical. Now, you start, we started talking about your local travels. Before we get there, I want to go back to the session for a moment. Were you surprised at the budget process? Now, the transportation budget went fairly smoothly. We didn't see a gas tax increase, which I was surprised at. Uh, capital budget seemed to go pretty smoothly, but this operating budget was beyond belief. Well, even with the transportation budget, which was uh, had a bipartisan uh, proposal from the House, when it, by the time it got done with the Senate, it really didn't look a lot like what we started with. So, I mean, there was a lot of uh, behind closed doors type negotiating. And at the end of the session, we were asked within uh, just the you know, last two days of the session to, to vote and approve a you know, multi-billion you know, dollar uh, budget. And so, you know, the operating budget, we, we had very little input on. Yeah, and that and, came down to the wire at the end too. And and so you know, to me, the, the, the whole budgeting process from the the operating side, where we increased it by eighteen point three percent, with uh, you know new projects, but we're we're not taking care of what we are obligated to do right now. Right. And that's that's to me is the biggest concern because those are you know, some very pressing issues, and if you're creating new issues, that is going to be dependent upon new money, well then the budget has to continue to grow. Yeah, and well we always fight that bow wave that comes especially mm -hmm. with an increase like that and with the potential of a slowing economy, which we're right. starting to see pieces of. So we uh, we finish up the session, you come home, now it changes, it's a different mode entirely. You're out visiting, you're out uh, seeing people. What are the big concerns that you're seeing in the 12th district now? What are the number, top three concerns that people have going into the next year? Well, I think you know probably the, the three top things that I've heard about uh, it would be you know schools, 
uh, the, the actual regulatory environment for business, and then, you know, agriculture and, and just making sure that we're able to, to keep, uh, you know, ag, the ag economy going. Now, some of that you can't, you know, the immigration side, you really don't have a lot to do with. That's more federal, and that's certainly a big concern. But you're talking about other regulatory issues beyond that. Well, actually, I'm, I am talking about labor, which does appear to be more of a federal thing. But the state, because they're a sub-agent of the federal government as it relates to the H-2A program, the state has gotten involved in regulating some of those ah, right. elements, which does have a ripple effect. So if you're not even an H-2A employer, you know, you are depending upon, you know, the local or the, the uh, U.S. workers to, to provide, you know, your uh, labor and if they're being impacted at the H2A side it does have a direct effect. So I mean they, they're, it, as you well know I mean governing is a very complex uh, you know process. It, it's not just localized you know because it, we are in a global uh, economy mm -hmm. and it, it has its many uh, facets and tentacles that reach out and, and, and often you know affect you in ways that you don't understand until you're down the road a ways. So, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, I'll go back though to the, on the state side with the education, I mean, I think school districts are still trying to figure out where do we stand, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of money do we have? And, and, you know, the money was given, but it also came with some, some uh, strings, strings attached, attached yeah. you know? uh -huh. and so what used to be allowed at the local level now is not allowed. Mm -hmm. And then other dollars, you know, you're supposed to invest it here. Well, each district has a different uh, needs ne needs, mm -hmm. and the way that they've, uh, you know, fashioned their curriculum for their, their communities sure. it does, you know, does vary. One size doesn't fit all. No. And then from the business side, I mean, I just continue to hear from business people that, you know, we can't handle any more taxes. And that yeah. was a, you know, a real uh, favorite thing of this last session was B&O. Well, you know, the businesses can pay a little more. Mm -hmm. And that, that really is coming home to, to not only impact the, the people with their businesses, but then they have to pass that cost on. They, you know, whether it's in a restaurant or whether it's some other service that you're providing, you can absorb, continue to absorb that and actually keep your doors open. Well, I just, uh, and right down that line, I just read an article today about uh, how big a concern this new minimum wage on January 1st going to 1350, and they broke down what the expense was per person, it was pretty startling because you not only have the increase in minimum wage, but then you have other people that have to move up that ladder. Mm -hmm. But you've also got the payroll taxes and everything that goes with it. Now you've got a paid family leave program right. and paid sick leave mm -hmm. on top of that. So this is like the perfect storm coming at small business. And I, I think it's, uh, that one's the, the fear I have is uh, particularly for, like you said, our restaurants and small operations, that they're just not going to survive another hit. So I, I can see that would be an issue. Um, on ag back, uh, labor is obviously a, a factor, but you also have to deal with that minimum wage and the paid sick leave and all those factors. Some people don't, you know, realize that that's all part of that too. Well, in, you know, one of the things that I've made a point of trying to share with people is that in, in the ag economy, there, there really aren't, I, I don't think that, I'm not aware of too many people that are paying minimum wage. I mean, we've far gone beyond right. that. And, and yet you get that compression factor. So when that minimum wage rises, mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, people say, well, minimum wage is this, so I should therefore, I was above minimum wage so much before, right. I should be again. And, and so you continually see, you know, that, that increased pressure that, it, that each business has. And, and as you mentioned, all the other, uh, you know, costs that go along with that are, are not often factored in. Well, and you can't raise your prices. I mean, in agriculture, you're kind of controlled <laughs> on your pricing. A restaurant can raise prices, but again, that's a problem because it's getting more and more costly to go out. People just will not go out. Right. Uh, one of the pieces of this article that really startled me was the labor group saying it's a good thing because the businesses that survive will be better off. That, that's a horrible thing to say. We're going to put a bunch of people out of business, uh, and but the guys that survive that can figure it out will do okay with that. Well, that's that's I just don't see that being a positive. All right, so you're back, you're visiting, you've been out on the front lines. Uh, coming up, we got a short session. It's going to sneak up on you faster than you think. Uh, and here we go again. Now, you're going into this short session with these concerns, things that are already happening, but potentially more. We just saw Bill potentially introduce. There's a uh, talk about a, a basic income, you know, bill that's going to guarantee a individual income. We've talked about capital gains and income tax, and the new speaker says it's on the table. 
So on top of everything that's happening now, there's more to come in the short session. What do you think? How far will these folks go? Well, from some of the things that, that came before us in our committees in this last session, and you know, I anticipate that they'll come back, um, they could go quite a ways. <laughs> yeah, that's I think when the I concern, say quite especially a ways, with a new speaker. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and when you think about you know a, a guaranteed wage, I mean, when you have already been artificially raising the minimum wage mm -hmm. to make people more competitive, I mean, the anticipation there is that if people go to work, they will get a set set wage. But if I'm not sure, I mean, I've seen some places where basically they're writing a check to every citizen. And, I believe and that, this bill is universal basic income and just says everybody deserves a basic income whether they work or not. I mean, that's so far out there to yeah. me, but that, that's the kind of thing that we're seeing from particularly Seattle-based legislators who pretty much dominate the thing over there. And that's, I think, you know, J.T. Wilcox was on with us a few weeks ago, and that was his concern is these guys really are pushing the envelope. And I think, you know, one of the things that I, I did, you know, became very apparent. I always th thought that I felt this way, but it was really reinforced when you get over and deal with a lot of legislators who really are not involved in small business. Mm -hmm. uh, or even, you know, if they're involved in a big business, they're all getting a, a, a check. They, they're not really having to look at the bottom line. You know, how do we make this? How do we make payroll? Right. And that's one of the biggest issues that, uh, you know, a small business has. But in a small business, I think the employees are a lot more cognizant of what it takes to make that business successful as opposed to a larger business where, you know, they've got pretty, you know, they've got these siloed uh, responsibilities. They don't really think that much about it because they get a direct deposit, you know, life goes on, uh, yeah. it's all fine. But when you're in a, in a r more rural area, people know who uh, the employers are in the, in the community. They know who they want to work for and they know why they want to work there. And they want to, they want to make sure that that business stays and is sustainable for that community. And there's a different attitude and a different mindset in the business uh, community in, in rural areas as there is as opposed to urban areas. And I, I do know that there are, there are you know tremendous uh, amount of entrepreneurs that are in the state of Washington, and and you see so much that has happened here. But you know what really does drive that e Washington economy is still the small business owner. Oh, absolutely. It's a good share of the jobs, but uh, they are under tremendous pressure, and I I think that is going to be the story of 2020 beyond politics which would be very interesting too all right well we're getting close to the end of our interview keith it's great to have you here i know uh, you did a great job by the way i watched what you did and uh, you and mike are a great team and of course mike's going to be here next week and we're going to have a chat with him too but um, anything you want to add any other uh, thing that i missed maybe about uh, this year so far and next year um i, I think one of the things that i just want to touch on as far as legislation uh, I am, you know, proposing a, a bill here that will help uh, equalize the, the cannabis licensing with the Liquor Control Board. And, you know, you would think that that would be just, it, it, my intent here is that there's complete transparency, it respects the, the local process, and it, it should have good support. But I also found last year that I thought I had a bill that had universal support with the little tax sticker for the gas ah, tax of all things and it did not pass so there's you know it'll be interesting to see how how things play out sometimes the simplest things are the hardest things to move there's no <laughs> doubt about it uh, any chance I know the caucus is talking about uh, some property tax relief because the budgets are so strong and you've got 3.1 billion at the last surplus now again at the last revenue report we think it's going to go higher um, I doubt it's going to happen but are you in feeling okay that that's a, it's a possibility that we could see some uh, property tax relief? I'm hoping and mm -hmm. I, you know right now I, I have been in uh, communication with uh, Representative Jim Walsh who is uh, planning to propose a bill that will roll back the property tax and, and quite honestly if we're going to get a handle on our budget we're going to have to have some constraints on the actual revenue collection. But if we can continue to just you know manufacture more dollars by raising taxes then uh, there's really no uh, there's no need to, to prioritize and to me you know we, we have to get a better handle on what we're doing at the state level before we can actually feel like we're being successful as a state because we're not well positioned for any kind of downturn in the economy we're we are taking on more and more responsibilities and you know some of these things are really going beyond the scope of what government really should be involved in so you know I'm hopeful that we can get some tax relief and, and get a good 
Uh, you make sure that our state agencies really are performing the way they they should, and rather not than uh, you know having that job creep that that uh, so often happens. So yeah, I think I'm that's job one is to get a handle on that budget because it's going to come back to haunt us in a big way. Keith, thanks for being here. We'll catch up with you during a short session. We'll be doing our usual visits during a short session. Looking forward to seeing just how crazy it gets over there. I'm sure you are too. So uh, we'll look forward to that and uh, have a great holiday if I don't see you. Well, thank you. All right, that's it. We'll be right back to wrap it up here at the 12th District. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Keith Gaynor, your state representative in the 12th District. He's got some substantial challenges ahead of him, uh, lots of issues popping up. And of course, with the new Speaker of the House, things are going to shift dramatically. And with only 41 members on the Republican side, it's unlikely they can do much uh, in terms of keeping the balance in Olympia. A universal income bill has even been introduced in Olympia, which is, I think, we're the first state to see that. That's about as far left as it gets. And uh, these are the kind of things I think we're going to see. I wish uh, Keith the best moving forward. All right, let's look at the national polls. We haven't done that for a few weeks. Things have changed on the Democrat side. It looks like uh, Mr. Biden is losing ground, and I mean losing a lot of ground. Last time we checked, uh, Biden was at 35 percent. He's now down to 27 percent. And the big winner on the Democrat side in the last few weeks has been Elizabeth Warren, who has moved up eight points to 27, virtually tied. So now Biden and Warren are tied at the top. Bernie Sanders, another loser, dropping from 19 to 18 to 15, now down around 14 percent. Looks like he has some health issues to deal with. I think uh, Warren is stealing most of Sanders' uh, people, and it looks to me like it's down to Biden and Warren unless somebody comes out of the blue. All right, presidential approval poll, 43 percent. That's about where it's been, 43 to 45, depending on the poll you look at. Hasn't changed much. People are pretty dug in on the president. But when it comes to the economy, it's interesting that he gets 50 percent approval for one of the best economies probably in history. We just announced a 3.5 percent unemployment rate. That's the lowest in 50 years. And while people say the economy is slowing down, I think that has a lot to do with the Chinese trade situation, which I believe will be resolved and uh, put things back on track. Interest rates are coming down. Housing is starting to heat up again. So things are moving in the right direction. And uh, the 50 percent says it's all politics in that poll, not what's really happening on the ground. Local races heating up. Uh, Barron versus Hemphill and the local school board race and Jakes versus Tiger. Those are going to be interesting and close races. Also, the Chelan mayor's race with Getty and Cooney are, is really uh, really a division between old thinking and new thinking and maybe traditional, I should say, versus uh, maybe some new stuff. And we'll see what Chelan thinks about that. East Wenatchee mayor's race and Indiana mayor's race also heating up. Last but not least, folks, if you're going to donate, donate your money directly to candidates, whether they're local, whether they're state, or whether they're federal. These groups that you see that solicit you every day, the various groups uh, on different subjects, really aren't very efficient with your money. If you're going to spend that hard-earned money on a candidate or on a cause, go after the candidate that is of your choice, regardless of which side they're on. Direct to the candidate is the only place to spend your political money, not to groups and probably not to parties. All right, that's it for the 12th District. This is Kerry Condotta. Don't forget our news at 5, 6, and 10 o'clock. And we'll be back next week with Mike Steele, an interview with the other state representative, and see what he thinks of the coming session and the new Speaker of the House as well. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.